I am literature. I am great literature. There's no truly lived life that it is not great literature. And so Alexei Navalny, friend, brother, father, husband, beloved, hero, valiant man, man of valor, man of value, man of Valentine, valence of reality. Go in peace. And of course, you know, we've all heard, you know, the heartbreaking, the heartbreaking news that Alexei Navalny died. Now, Alexei Navalny first was a figure who stood for, for laughter and good cheer, right? He appeared. The day before he died, he was videoed in court for a hearing, and he was making fun of with the good cheer of laughter, the guards telling him to put some money in his account because he was a little short. And so I'm going to just start on a light note, which is Alexei Navalny, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. So I listened to six different pronunciations, you know, that feature on the web now where you put in a name and then you ask someone to pronounce it. And so I got six different pronunciations of Alexei Navalny. So first, I just apologize for, for not getting the right pronunciation. But although I don't know exactly how to pronounce Navalny's name, I do know that my heart is and has been for, for several years blown away by his courage, by his goodness, by his fearlessness. And perhaps most important, by his being literally an incarnation of value. He became value. He became value itself. And I want to let Navalny talk for himself. He's been murdered. He was murdered quite clearly by Putin. He was quite alive a day before a blood clot was claimed by the prison authorities to go to his brain. He was clearly murdered. I'll share with you just a little bit of his life. He was obviously just, in case anyone wants to point out his imperfection, he was imperfect. In his early years, he was too associated with very, very, very problematic, ultra-nationalist, xenophobic Russian patriotic movements that spoke in ways that, that were wrong. And he regretted it. So he was imperfect. He went through many stages of development. He wasn't a philosopher. He wasn't a moralist. He was, in the end, an inveterate blogger with enormous moral courage, with wild and beautiful imagination, with love in his eyes. Love in his eyes and a song in his heart and courage in his blood and fire in his veins and fierce goodness and waging a campaign against corruption all over Russia, but against corruption, which was in his direct understanding, which was correct. He was right. Corruption that had 
eaten at the very heart of the Russia that he loved. And the Russia that he loved was the Russia that was filled with literature. And he loved literature. Was filled with depth, was filled with nuance. Was filled with a beauty that the world needed to hear. A Russia that participated in the global story of value. I'm not going to rehearse his life. And the reason I'm making this this video, this you know wildly imperfect video in, in bad lighting in a hotel room and telling Z Man, Zion and KK, hey guys, could you please like not talk for for a while while I make this video? Is because I can't not speak. This is not a moment to be silent. We have to eulogize. We have to feel the pain of the loss, and we have to celebrate. We have to celebrate Alexei Navalny's life as a life which is hope itself, a life which is itself a memory of a, a possible future, which must become true. So the way I want to do this, with your permission, is to actually let Alexei Navalny speak in his own words and just to add a few thoughts. And the way I'm going to try and do that is I'm going to pull up an interview from the website of a Russian writer. It's one of the country's most famous long exiled writers. The pseudonym is Boris Akunin, A-K-U-N-I-N. And I'm going to rely on Elena, my dear friend, to correct all of my mispronunciations. But now is not a time to, this is not a debate. I don't want to debate his life. I want to eulogize. And to eulogize a person's life is to try and capture something of their essence, which both honors them in the next stage of their journey, which both allows them to impact us. And by their impacting us, they're fully alive. And by being fully alive, they're able to actually take, take the next stage of the journey. And by hearing them, by feeling them, that hope that they, and in this case, he, Alexei Navalny incarnated, that hope becomes a flame, that hope becomes alive. So I'm going to read from the website of Boris Akunin, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing, who again is a pseudonym for one of Russia's most famous and long exiled writers. And Akunin sent a basically a 13 point questionnaire to an entire community of dissidents, of political prisoners around Russia. And these are Navalny's responses. But before I read the questions and his responses, it's enough to note that he spent multiple years, five or six intense years, between 2004, 2011, directly confronting in his very soul, the core corruption in Russia, in, at the very heart of the system. And he realized, and this was his great realization, that in some sense, the corruption wasn't a side hustle in Russia, that actually the Russian soul had been hijacked, that the soul of Mother Russia had become corrupt with the corruption, that corruption had become the essence of Russia, and that Putin 
who embodied the corruption became a danger to the very heart of the Russia that he loved and that lived. And that that corruption was, was a corrosive force on the gorgeous literatures of Russia. And that fear and greed drove corruption, fear and greed. And so that therefore the response to corruption had to be to mock greed, to expose and mock greed, and to laugh at fear. And that's what he did. He laughed at fear, and he mocked and exposed greed. He ran for the mayor of Russia in 2000, the mayor of Russia, the mayor of Moscow in 2011, got some 27% of the vote, was understood to be a kind of a profound challenge to Putin. He, of course, organized. He was an organizer. Think about the, the union organizers in the United States. He was a social media, internet organizer. He had created like 40 offices, a, an entire series of interlocking websites, which were anti-corruption websites, which became the core of his political machine. And he would have run for president. The Kremlin, of course, devised a law contrived a law which prevented him from running for president, but he became the symbol of holy laughter. Laughter that was courage itself. Laughter that, that mocked corruption. Again, that laughed at fear and exposed and mocked greed. In the end, Nine years later, on a plane, in the middle of a, a political campaign, he was poisoned. He almost died. He was miraculously airlifted to Berlin. It took five months for him to recover. And after he recovered, he could have spent you know, his life leading Russia as a dissident in exile, but he didn't. He made an insanely courageous decision to go back and to return to Russia. It was quite clear he'd be arrested. He was. You know, I, I jotted down, you know, he said at his trial, which was, of course, a, a mock trial held at some police station, but there was a moment where he could speak and he said, he will, he, he referring to, to Putin, he'll, he will enter history as a poisoner. You know, we in Russia have had, and again, I apologize for the mispronunciations. We in Russia have had Yaroslav the Wise, Alexander the Liberator, and Vladimir the Poisoner of Underpants. Because the, the toxin that was used to kill him was placed in his underpants. And he had the last word in that moment. He mocked Putin. He laughed. And laughter undermines evil. Laughter undermines the pomposities of power. Not immediately. It takes time. But laughter is the language of courage. You know, there, was, there was a particular moment when Navalny is able to understand who the key person was involved in planning his assassination, the poisoning. And she actually calls that person pretending to be someone else. And he says, you know, what happened? What, what went wrong with the Navalny thing? Like, why didn't we get him? And, and the person is taken in and they, they start discussing. Why didn't we, why didn't we succeed in killing Navalny? He's laughing. He's laughing with unimaginable audacity and unimaginable courage. And so I want to, to speak in his own words, even after he's put in prison in 2021, when he returns to Russia, he remains 
potent and, and courageous and shockingly beautiful voice. Putin wants to cut him off from all communication, so he's moved to Siberia. I know something about Siberia indirectly. Much of my family died in Siberia. My father was in Siberia during World War II with his father. And he described Siberia in detail. So descriptions of Siberia were, were part of my earliest youth. He sent to Siberia, cut off from everyone. And essentially starved in isolation. And somehow he holds the mood. He holds his laughter. He says, I can only be in prison. I decide to be in prison. Prison exists in my mind. I'm not in prison. I'm on, I'm on a space voyage. And on February 16th, 2024, one leg of that space voyage, that voyage in the space-time continuum that is our world, ended. And he went on to the next world. Murdered and martyred. And his voice has only just begun. Alexei Navalny has only just begun to fight. And Alexei Navalny has only just begun to love. So I want to read you his responses to the 13 questions in the interview that I described earlier, which is posted on Boris Akunin's website. It was translated from the Russian into English by Nikolai Formazov, edited by Joanne Turnbull. Question one, who are you? And who are you? And, and the reason I'm going to read these questions and answers is because what I think you're about to see and hear and feel is that what allowed, what caused, what empowered, what potentiated Navalny's courage was first values and first principles embedded in a story of value, which is the core of the revolution that we're standing for here in writing the great library of cosmorotic humanism in this time between worlds. He literally reads and he absorbs and he doesn't have the language for it exactly, but he understands it deep in his body, deep in his heart, deep, if you will, in his Russian soul. that a human being has to stand for value or we're not actually alive. And he was asked, he was asked many times, why did you return? And he said, and I love my country madly. And I have strong beliefs and I've got to stand for them. And I've got to stand for them, even if that means sacrifice. And he understood that that meant, even if it means the ultimate sacrifice. Because Navalny understood that if, if there's nothing that's a true value, an authentic value, a clarified value, that I'm willing to die for, then I'm not alive. Now, to be clear, it's easy to die for false values. People do it all the time. Fundamentalist Islamic versions of jihad of the kind that perpetrated the October 7th massacre, which was premeditated and preordained, in which women were tortured, nails driven into their bodies while their breasts were cut off as they were being raped, eyes gouged out. And I want to say it. All ignored by virtually the entire world. Wow. 
And the people that perpetrated those actions that were jacked up on amphetamines were willing to die for those false values. We also have to be willing to die for values that are real. The idea is not to die for them, the idea is to live for them. But first I've got to identify what am I willing to die for? What matters? And if you want to know what's the spark of the sacred, we talked about it a few weeks ago, what's the spark of the sacred? In the fallen forms of jihad, it is the realization that there's something that's worth dying for. That staying alive forever as the absolute value, let me live as long and comfortably as I can and I will give up anything just to stay alive a little longer is right. It is the picture of, of Dorian Gray, Oscar Wilde, right? It's the source of all corruption. But I need to be able to clarify my values to know what's actually worth dying for. And not all values, the way they're presented are true. Values can be distorted and degraded. And we actually can get beneath the degradations. We can get beneath distortions. And we can articulate a shared set of first principles and first values, a universal grammar of value as a context for our diversity, right? a story of value in which we know that, that we stand together, that that which unites us is so much greater than that which divides us, and we stand for value. And value inspires us and it ennobles us and it makes us cry and it makes us laugh. And those clarified values are good and they're true and they're beautiful. And we live or die by them. So I want to I wanna try and clarify this through Navalny's words. Question one, who are you? So he answers, from the prison authorities, I constantly hear this disgruntled phrase. Hmm, you seem to be in a good mood today. I mean, the prison authorities are like, why in a good mood? You're like in the middle of Siberia. You're never getting out of here. Why would you be in a good mood? So Navalny says, so I guess it's like this. I'm a political prisoner who very much misses his family, work, and colleagues, but who keeps in good spirits. I'm also, of course, a reader. And I spend most of my day with a book in my hands. And that's how it begins. So the first thing he says is, mood is everything. Heidegger got that right. Mood is the central category of reality, and I am responsible for my mood. And my mood can be good if I'm living a life which is a purpose-driven life, a life aligned with value. A life aligned with values, a life of joy. Not the values of some far right, a xenophobic position, but the value, which is the air we breathe. Value is the air we breathe. Just like there's space and time in the manifest world, there's value. Value is not hard to find, value is impossible to avoid. And if I live in value, then my spirits can be good, no matter what. Wow. What do you believe in? He's asked. In God and science. Right, in God and science. I believe we live in a non-deterministic universe and have free will. Right, so there's laws of science, and yet there's freedom. In other words, freedom itself is a first principle and first value. Our choices matter. I believe we're not alone in the universe, right? That's what we would call in cosmic humanism, the intimate universe, right? So one, freedom is a first principle and first value. There's new possibility. Reality is the possibility of possibility. It's not a deterministic universe. There are railroad tracks. There are constraints, but there are places where the, the tracks fork and new possibility lives in the system itself. And we're not alone in the universe, meaning in the language of cosmorotic humanism, we live in an intimate universe. 
I believe that our deeds and actions will be evaluated. Evaluation is only possible when we realize that we live in a field of value. So we're accountable. We're accountable not in a fire and brimstone way. We're accountable in this way in which we tremble before evolution with joy. And we know that we count. But if I'm accountable, I count. If I incarnate value, then it's appropriate and mad joy to be evaluated. Not an evaluation that causes a free-floating, irrational, sick anxiety. About an evaluation that arouses the sense of joy. The joy that I'm worthy of being evaluated. And he says, and I believe in true love. We call that eros, right? The eros that lives between human beings and the eros that drives and animates all of evolution. And he says, I believe that Russia will be happy and free. And as I believe in the future possibility, I believe that the status quo doesn't rule. That's the teaching of the Exodus in the Bible, which which Navalny read well, just like he read Kant, right? The story of the Exodus is Pharaoh will fall and Putin will fall. There'll be a moment, Navalny would say, where we'll look back and Putin will be a bad memory. And that is true. Putin will fall as Pharaoh fell. Because, because, Because Eros is on the move, because love is on the move. And then he says, and I do not believe in death. When he says, I don't believe in death, he means I don't believe that death is the end of the story. And we know death is not the end of the story. We know that death is a night between two days. We know that because there's deep realization. There's deep knowing that lives in us, as us, and through us. Wow. We know that because there's empirical information. We know that because philosophically, neither materialism, the reduction of the world to matter that doesn't matter, doesn't make any sense. And dualism doesn't make any sense, which means dualism means that God's over there. God's out there at the top half of the circle. The bottom half of the circle is purely material. And they're two separate worlds. That doesn't make any sense. We actually know that the reality is Interiors and exteriors all the way up and all the way down. And we, we know that reality is interiority. Every exterior has an interior. And we know that, that the raw and real essence of reality, the eros, the consciousness, the value is not bound by a particular material predicament. And we know that, again, we know it empirically through mounds of evidence collected in the last 140 years. We know it philosophically. But we also know it anthro-ontologically. I remember being at my dear friend Barb Marks Hubbard's deathbed. And it was clear that the Barbara I had just spoken to two days before, and who said, Mark, as the doctor put her on the phone, filled with life. It was the last word she spoke. Barbara hadn't disappeared. Barbara was here. Barbara is here. When I feel my beloved friend Sally Kempton, especially in the last 10 days, speak to me. Speak to me in the sense that I feel her presence. I feel her reality. I feel her living presence. It's a direct experience. And there are Actually, 12 gateways, which I'm not going to talk about now, but which are direct experiences that live inside of us, in which we have direct access to the continuity of consciousness. And so, Navalny is filled with courage because he lives in a field of value, because he knows of the continuity of consciousness, because he's delighted. Delighted to be alive because he's in love with love. He knows that love is real. 
And he knows that it always changes. And he knows that dictators fall. And he knows that Putin is going to be known as the poisoner of underpants. Well, hmm. what's the main thing in life? He responds to be useful to society and to remain a good person. And I would add to be uniquely good, right? To be, to be good is not generally good. To be good is unique for each of us. To be the good person that only I can be and to be of service. To play my instrument, the unique self-symphony. Next question, and I'm not going to do all of them, but next question, what brings you the most joy? Remember, my friends, the scene that we played two years ago in the movie Don't Look Up? They've got just a few minutes left to live, and they, they gather and have dinner together and talk and drink wine. So he answers, Alexei answers, what brings me the most joy are simple family moments, like going somewhere together in the car. One of us starts goofing around and singing, and the rest join in, and we can't stop till we've sung a bunch of songs, and the love and happiness overflow. What most saddens you, the interviewer asks. The unwillingness of many people to think. Their incomprehension of basic cause and effect relationships. Everyone, every time someone says to me something like, corruption doesn't affect my life. Or the people in power have done all their stealing. But if the new people come to power, the stealing will start all over again. So they give up. I think. Navalny says, I think, how is it that hundreds of millions of years of evolution have given this person the most amazing brain? They don't use it. Right? Not to realize that my actions matter. That standing for a cause matters. The next question is, what brings the greatest evil to man and mankind? Navalny responds, he responds, all it takes for evil to triumph is the inaction of good people. A phrase, he, he says, that's attributed to many, though. No one knows exactly who said it. And he says, you know, and I checked, I couldn't find it myself. It's amazingly accurate. The hypocrisy of neutrality. And this is one of the tragedies of the integral movement. The integral movement, which is an important and beautiful movement. Animated by its leading philosopher, my dear, dear friend, Ken Wilbur. But too many of the people in the integral world, and Ken and I have talked about this many times, they manage to find all sides of an issue. They take all perspectives, which is beautiful. That's a good step. But then after you take all perspectives, you got to get brave. You got to get courageous. Then you got to take a stand. And the integral world manages way too many of its core persona hide in perspective taking and actually lack genuine courage to actually take a stand. Rather, they get involved in the corruption of cliques and the corruption of popularity and the corruption of commodified intellect sold to prop up the fragile ego. And they lose contact with basic decency Basic honesty, basic integrity. The hypocrisy of apoliticism, says Navalny, which conceals laziness, cowardice, and meanness. It's a big deal. It's very tragic. It's very tragic. We got to move to the post-tragic, and the move to the post-tragic is the claiming of courage. And the claiming of courage says, I'm willing to take a stand. And I'm willing to transcend my obeisance, my kneeling, my bowing to various forms of McCarthyism, my bowing to the rule of a broken information ecology that reigns on the internet. 
got to actually take a stand. And I take a stand in small acts of courage, which are large acts of integrity. And I don't actually evaluate, well, I'm going to betray this person. I'm going to let this person be run over. I'm not going to take a stand on the truth here. I won't have courage there because I'm protecting my legacy. I'm protecting my good works. That's bullshit. Take a stand. We all have to take a stand for each other. All of us. And there's a thousand reasons to justify the politics of neutrality. Navalny says, the hypocrisy of neutrality conceals laziness, cowardice, and meanness. And it's the principal reason why a bunch of well-organized villains can rule over millions. And what's the great act of being alive? And Navalny answers beautifully, he says, engaging in the battle of the good versus the neutral. It's not even the good versus evil. It's good versus the neutral. And the reason people are able to stay neutral is not just laziness, not just cowardice, not just meanness, but they actually step out of the field of value. And when you step out of the field of value, you're not going to take a stand. You only take a stand when you're in the field of value. Last question I'm going to read is what art has the strongest effect on you? And he writes, I love literature and I consider that I know something about it. Yeah, me too. Beautiful. I like movies. By the way, Navalny loved Star Wars. Music and architecture, but I don't know much about them. As for the rest of the arts, I will diplomatically say I treat them with respect. Literature, though, he says, has the strongest effect of any art form. After all, it works through your own imagination. What could be stronger than that? I'm going to read two more of the questions. Do you have a favorite maxim? And he has two, a maximum, a saying of wisdom. You know, one, he quotes from Kant, act in such a way that the maxim of your action may become a rule of universal behavior, meaning the value that you stand for is a value which is universal. It's part of the intrinsic structure of reality. So you standing for it points to it as a universal value. And finally, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Mm. Wow. Why was Putin so afraid of Navalny? Why did Putin kill him? Why did he need to be killed? From Putin's perspective, he needed to be killed because value stands against fear. And value stands against corruption. Which is precisely why at this moment of metacrisis, as we literally stand poised between utopia and dystopia, which is not just an issue of Russia or of Israel or of the battle against the value that Hamas stands for, which is a form of anti-value, a form of anti-truth. It has nothing to do with Gaza and Israel. It has nothing to do with Jewish-Arab coexistence, which should be a given. Hamas stands for anti-value at its very core. It's got nothing to do with the particular context of Israel. Hamas stands for jihad in its most corrupt form, and jihad takes place in Iraq and Libya where there is no Israel. And we're afraid to say that. Right, don't say that, Mark. Don't say that's going to be unpopular. You'll lose a couple of people. Fuck that. 
right? We have to speak truth, right? And when we're afraid to, because we'll lose some some people on our channel, we'll lose some popularity, and that doesn't work. We stand against any kind of ethnocentrism, which says that my people are more important than value. Value lives in all of us, and we we stand for value. And value is more powerful than any other force in the world. See, it's value that makes a hero. And Alexei Navalny is a hero. And he loved Hollywood movies in which heroes won because he understood in his very bones that the next stage of human history the emergence of the new human and the new humanity is going to be a new human and a new humanity who stand for value. Heroes. That's why a hero is filled with valor. A hero is valiant. When I grew up, we would read again, we would read about a particular knight named Prince Valiant. And valor and valiant derive, as we said, maybe it was last week from the same Latin root, which is valere, be strong in your worth and your value. Valencia, the intrinsic worth that lives in reality, that lives in you. And, and Valentine, Valentine, love, eros. Alexei Navalny sends a message just a few days ago and Valentine's Day to his wife. He said, I love you madly. I love you so much. And although you're so far away, you're so close, right next to me, by my side. And they were madly in love with each other. He says, I believe in true love. And our love lists are too short. Love is real. And the hero stands for Valentius. For eros, which is value, which creates the hero, who is valor, who is valiant, who is value, who is the unique valence of cosmos, the unique incarnation of value moving through him. And Putin is not a hero. Putin's a coward. Putin is. Hmm. The poisoner of underpants. Vladimir, the poisoner of underpants. Yeah, not okay. Not okay. Not okay. It's not okay. Alexei Navalny, hero, says it's time for a new world. It's time for the democratization of the hero. It's why the importance, the centrality of the new hero, the hero is imperfect. The hero is flawed, but the hero is a hero. The hero is a hero because he or she stands in eros for value. And we live or die for value, for goodness, truth, and beauty, and, and it lives beyond death. Value transcends, it ends the trance of death, and we, we step into the next journey of value. That's why Marvel movies, in the middle of the postmodern collapse of value, Marvel movies have been so popular for the last 10 years because the hero is the early adopter of Homo Amor, the new human, the new humanity, in which every human being knows. I'm a unique hero and I've got a unique risk to take and a unique life to live and a unique gift to give, a unique quality of eros to shine into reality, a unique song to sing and a unique poem to write and a unique way of laughing, living and loving. That's irreducibly mine that the world desperately needs. It's my value. It's my gorgeousness. It's my eros. It's my intimacy. It's my aliveness. It's the art. That is me. I am literature. 
I am great literature. There is no truly lived life that it is not great literature. And so Alexei Navalny, friend, brother, father, husband, beloved, hero, valiant man, man of valor, man of value, man of valentine, valence of reality, go in peace. And may your flame burn bright and free Mother Russia and participate in the birth out of this crisis. Our crisis is a birth of the new human and the new humanity and the emergence of the most good, true, and beautiful world that we've always known is the true nature of the real. Go in peace, brother. Thank you, everyone. Mad love. Yeah. I want to just add two more things. One is just to expand the circle. And the second is to ask me to ask you to ask us a very direct question. So first, this is not just about one man. We're talking here about the democratization of the hero, the democratization of, of unique risk. And there's an entire world of Russia of heroes who gave up their lives to oppose Stalin, to oppose later versions of Stalinism, and then to oppose oppose Putin at the cost of their lives. And I'm just going to mention a couple of names. In some sense, the father of someone very close to us who's here today might well be on this list of names. But let me just give you four names. Just you can through them get a sense of so many, so many names. And all of them are inscribed in the very fabric of reality. All of them are inscribed in the book of life. All of them are inscribed on the divine throne. All of them are inscribed in the continuity of consciousness. So first, Anna Politkovskaya. And again, I apologize if I pronounce the name wrongly. Anna Politkovskaya, journalist and author of Putin's Russia, who was shot dead on October 7th, 2006, Putin's birthday, in the elevator of her apartment in Moscow. She was 48 years old. Alexander Litvinenko was hospitalized for polonium-210 poisoning and died 22 days later on November 23, 2006. His chief crime was saying out loud what everyone suspected that Russian intelligence had killed the oligarch Boris Berezovsky. Three, Sergei Magnitsky, responsible for exposing corruption by Russian government officials, serves a 358-day sentence in a Moscow prison and he dies in 2009, November 16th, at 37 years old. Boris Nemetsov was assassinated in 2015 on February 27th, standing next to his Ukrainian wife on a bridge near the Kremlin in Moscow, 
where he was organizing a rally against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And Boris once wrote, he wrote, there's always been a surplus of servitude and a deficit of freedom in Russia. We value those who grovel, which is why Russia remains a nation of slaves and princes to this day. I don't know what Russia remains. That's not for me to say. But it is to say that we hold and we remember every person. No one died in vain. There is no forgotten deaths. Everything is reported. Everything is inscribed. And what allows Navalny to be fearless is he understands in his body that it's beyond death, that it doesn't end when it ends, that death is not the last act. It's a transitional act. It's when the play really starts. And integrity only comes from that knowing. So I want to end with a funny, serious, beautiful, poignant, painful note. You know, in 2021, when Navalny was going back to Russia after awakening in Berlin five months after being poisoned, he's sitting next to his wife and what they did on <laughs> the plane as they watched a movie, Rick and Morty an animated series involving a, a mad scientist. A month later, he's on trial. And he quotes Rick and Morty. And the simple quote is, to live is to risk all. Right? To live is to risk all. Otherwise, you're just an inert chunk of randomly assembled molecules drifting wherever the universe blows you, right? To live is to risk all. Otherwise, you're just an inert chunk of randomly assembled molecules drifting wherever the universe blows you. That's what we mean by unique risk. And I want to I want to close just by asking you a question. Why did Navalny go back to Russia? He could have stayed in Germany. He could have been a leader in exile. And I don't know if he was wrong or right. I don't know if there's a wrong or right here. I'm certainly not going to second guess Navalny after he gave up his life. But he decided to go back. He decided that there was a unique risk that was his to take. Even if it cost him his life, he was willing to stake his life on it. Is there a place for each of us where we need to go back to Russia? Is there a flight we need to get on? For 99.9% .9 of us here, that's not going to mean imprisonment in Siberia. That's not what it's going to mean. For 99.9% .9 of us, it's not going to mean death, but it might mean dying to a part of ourselves. It might mean being born in a new way. It might mean being willing to step in to my greatness. And to step into my greatness, I need two things, to live with being afraid and to be fearless and to do them together. So thank you for being here today. Do I have a flight to catch? Is there a flight back to Russia that's mine to take? And can I look at Alexei Navalny in the eyes right now and say, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for inspiring me to get on my flight, to take my unique risk, to be home more and more, to be unique self and to play my instrument in the Unique Self Symphony. Navalny, 
as we said at the end of the last clip. Shalom, shalom. Go in peace. Until next time.